uh, collectively, allegedly, uh, together with others at that period of time in presentations to the Georgia Senate, uh, Dr. Eastman making false statements to the Georgia Senate. We have no indication specifically as to the alleged false statements that he made. But mm -hmm. to the extent this has not been raised before, I wish to raise it now. Unlike the, under the First Amendment to the federal constitution, freedom of speech clause, we also have a clause of being able to uh, address government for grievances. Uh, so we have yet a different type of First Amendment right being exercised by Dr. Eastman in his presentation uh, to the Georgia uh, State Assemb uh, Senate. Now, whatever was said is recorded, it's evidence, it's going to be played, so it is what it is. But in the indictment, we have on page 16, paragraph one, the grand jury uh, alleges that members of the enterprise corruptly, corruptly solicited Georgia legislators instead to unlawfully appoint their own presidential legislators for the purpose of casting electoral votes for Donald Trump. The word corruptly is an interesting word because it would appear to connote a degree of mens rea or specific intent. What is it that makes what was said corrupt? Was it something in the words themselves? We don't know. This is where I'm coming at to, from the work on the special demur. We don't know what it is, is the state's theory of the underlying nature, whether by direct, it should be by direct quotes, taken in the full context of the presentation that makes the words of Dr. Eastman corruptly stated. Likewise, um, and more particularly because this is more unique to Dr. Eastman, there are allegations, and in its response to the special mirror demotion um, motion, the state makes a point to bring up the various meetings Dr. Eastman had with Vice President Mike Pence, um, some involving then President Trump as well. And in the indictment uh, referring uh, to uh, the same phrase, uh, phraseology uh, on page 18, uh, paragraph six, it identifies that members, quote, members of the enterprise, including several of the defendants, corruptly solicited the vice president of the United States to violate the United States Constitution and federal law by unlawfully rejecting electoral college votes cast in Fulton County, Georgia, by duly elected and qualified presidential electors from Georgia. Members of the enterprise also corruptly solicited the vice president to reject votes cast by the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from several other states. Again, what is it within the language of the communication allegedly made by Dr. Reisman or within his presence that indicates what is corrupt about the language. What is it that it, it, are we, or do we refer back to, or are we referred back to the overall so-called objective of the racketeering, of the alleged objective of the lack rac racketeering uh, activity in the enterprise through the acts of racketeering? Or are we just to anticipate that what corruptly will be defined as is whatever the state just simply argues it to be. It's a violation, you know, the ipso facto, the electoral, uh, the election had been certified, therefore any communication contrary to the certification of the Biden electors, ipso facto makes it corrupt. Is it is it so much the word corrupt or it's just that you you believe that there should be a more specific reference to exactly the content of the speech. So, for example, that it just said illegally solicited, 
I mean, again, maybe we'll hear exactly where the word corrupt was used, if that's more of a term yeah. of art or what. But well, is it the corruption that's causing the confusion in your argument, or is it more that just they haven't put in the quote, this is what he said on this particular I'm day? looking for more detail specifically. I'm looking for more detail. Why? Because the issue is going to arise at the time of the resting of the state's case in chief whether or not, based on the terms and language of this indictment, the state has met its burden, or, or the case can proceed to a jury, if you will. So I don't have any hesitation in telling the court, this is where we're coming from. More detail, and that essentially is our argument, and I don't, give, certainly given the amount of time the court has had to spend it already with the, uh, adoption of the previous arguments i have nothing further to say at this time yeah. well i'm curious i know that the the filed motion focused more on kind of the boil factors kind of identifying how this enterprise is associated with what they did kind of the wanting more detail about the enterprise i'm just curious have you found an indictment maybe post boil that you think satisfies that in your opinion said satisfied it and no one's actually handed me an indictment that says this is a good post oil boil indictment other than this one which the state is saying is uh, i'm just curious i i mean i i first to answer directly i have not yet tried to make that search because i think it's a case-by-case -case specific analysis clearly in an associated association in fact enterprise there has to be some delineation as to the relationship among the conspirators in ter terms of their role. Now, from a federal racketeering point of view, you can't have, uh, you know, uh, a person who has lacks managerial capacity or some level of decision-making authority as part of the minister a member of the enterprise. I mean, there is some substance to each and every person's role in the Ernst v. That's Ernst v. Young, the 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 Supreme Court case dealing with the position of of a person with some authority in the association, in fact, enterprise. Um, the janitor is not a person who would generally be swept into the meet, uh, terminology of an enterprise of an organization is my simple point. Okay. But what I will be glad to do for the court is to supplement our position answering the court's question directly. All right. Uh, well, I guess that, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm worried I'm going down the rabbit hole on this one. It was the argument that, I know you said you wanted more information about the enterprise and, and Mr., or, uh, you know, all each defendant's role in it, but I hadn't heard this one yet that if they don't have some level of authority, they can't be included in the enterprise. Well, so that, I don't know if that's ba in here. Basic uh, federal uh, law. Okay. I, I, I hesitate to suggest it should be adopted by the court. Okay. So well, I'll put it this way. If it's if it's not in the written motions initially, uh, I won't get there. Okay. Well, then we're not going to get there. Okay. Well, let's, let's turn it over to Mr. Floyd, and we'll let you have the last word as well. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, I will uh, uh, start where my friend Mr. Parker ended. Uh, the test he's referring to, as he said, is Reeves versus Ernst and Young. That's referred to as the operation or management test under federal law. It does not apply to Georgia law. There is a uh, linguistic distinction. The federal statute, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1962C, says conduct or participate in the conduct of the enterprise. The second, the two dual use of conduct led the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, to conclude that that imposes some level of influence or control. Georgia says conduct or participate. Under Georgia law, participation is sufficient. There is no operation management or conduct uh, requirement. Uh, this is expressly laid out in Falachi. Uh, F-A-I-L-L-A-C-E, which we've cited a number of times. All right, fair enough. But I think because it, I don't think a brief has actually raised this yet or a motion, so we can, it, we can it move doesn't. on from there. Uh, in fact, I don't think anything Mr. Parker argued was in the brief. There is no reference to petitioning for redress of grievances in the brief. There's no reference to corruptly in the brief. Um, 
and he omits to address the fact that Mr. Eastman, I mean, what, what this has mutated into, it started out as a challenge to the Boyle factors. Let me just knock that out for a second. Um, there are four reasons why uh, those don't apply. Uh, first, and we've talked about this, so I'll be brief and try and avoid repeating myself. For the record, I'll adopt the same arguments we made in opposition to Ms. Palmer's motion last week, and I will do my very best not to repeat them uh, unnecessarily. Uh, first, no Georgia court has adopted Boyle. Second, Boyle was not a conspiracy case. Uh, Boyle dealt with jury instructions after the record had been made after the trial. Third, Boyle, um, uh, 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 let's see, jury instruction case. Fourth, an enterprise is not an element of a RICO conspiracy case. We cite your United States v. Applins out of the Second Circuit on that. It's in our brief. There are, new, there are at least three other circuits that have reached the same conclusion. I haven't found a federal circuit that reached the opposite conclusion. Um, so Boyle just doesn't apply. But if Boyle did, as I pointed out in earlier arguments, we trace its language exactly. So there's not, there's not a Boyle problem here. Um, what the argument has really mutated into is the idea that we haven't said enough detail about overt acts we allege Mr. Eastman engaged into. Engaged in two flaws for that, as we've pointed out in earlier briefs, so I won't belabor it. The state isn't required to allege the details of overt acts at all. We don't have to allege elements. We don't have to get into things like corruptly, which really just means illegally in a context like this. Um, this just not a pleading requirement, and and Ms. Dr. Eastman cites no case saying it is. Um, the federal cases, which incidentally apply exactly the same pleading standard uh, as the Georgia cases do when they look at special demurs, um, have rejected any such requirement. And I'll give you the sites of a couple of those in a moment. But just to start with United States versus Kelly, 462 F sub 3rd 191 at 196.97 in Eastern District of New York 2020 case. So relatively fresh off the presses expressly goes into this and says, there is no requirement that an indictment allege the sub elements of enterprise like the three Boyle factors. The federal courts have just said, no, that's not a pleading requirement. It may go to whether the state has proved its case at the end, might be subject to a directed verdict motion, but it is not a, a pleading requirement. Uh, and there are multiple federal cases holding that. Um, so uh, basically, what the federal courts have said is if the indictment basically explains who participated in the enterprise, what they did, describes the purpose, the means and methods, that's sufficient. An example of that is United States versus Torres, T-O-R-R-E-S, 191 F-3rd, 799 and 806. That's a Seventh Circuit case. Um, United States versus Johnson, 825 Fed Appendix 156 at 171, Fifth Circuit case, also 2020. If the, if the indictment identifies the criminal enterprise, establishes the time in which it operated, name the co names the co-conspirators and list the violations uh, that constitute predicate offenses and says which co-conspirator performed which act and when, that is sufficient. We've done exactly that. Um, we charged in the language of the statute, so that satisfies 17554, I believe it is, Your Honor. Uh, that's number one out of the gate. That's presumptively sufficient. If more detail is required, we set, we describe the enterprise, we describe its objective, we describe the eight schemes that were pursued in furtherance of it, two of which Mr. Parker referred to. We then laid out 161 overt acts. They have the dates, they have the participants. Uh, Dr. Eastman, um, who is saying he can't figure out what he's charged with, at least that's what his demur said, we have laid out 16 overt acts and where he acted with another person, which is the vast majority of them, uh, we have identified who those persons were and the nature of what the communications involved. Um, 
So, for example, we do refer to his representations to the Georgia Senate, along with defendants Giuliani and Ellis. We refer to his email communications with defendants, with defendant Chile and unindicted co-conspirators eight and two. We uh, reference him mailing a memo from his defendant Chesbro to defendant Giuliani. We reference his meeting together with Dr. Mr. Trump. Sometimes it's a telephone call, sometimes it's a face-to-face meeting. Um, further emails with Chesbro and unindicted co-conspirator three. Filing a uh, knowingly false verified complaint together with defendant Trump here in Fulton County. Um, call to the Speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives soliciting him to unlawfully appoint presidential electors from uh, Arizona. And then this all culminates in approximately four overt acts towards the end of the list, which directly involve meetings and communications with Vice President Pence and or Vice President Pence's chief of staff and counsel, all in pertaining Pence directly or through his representatives to not count the electoral votes from certain states or to suspend the count on January 6th. Um, when there was a reference to the janitor, and there actually is a federal case that does involve a janitor in the Second Circuit, and he was charged in a RICO, and the Second Circuit said, no, he, the janitor doesn't operate or manage, right? That case has nothing to do with this, number one, because that test doesn't apply, and number two, because janitors don't go to meetings with vice presidents and presidents. Uh, Dr. Eastman did. So we're really just getting down to did this happen or not. Um, and the argument that they need every detail, we've laid out, this is the meeting, this is who was there, this is when it happened, and this is what was discussed. I can't find any case that says that's not good enough. Um, and uh, this that just basically um, walks through it. There, the nexus argument, we've briefed it. It really hasn't been offered here. But you asked about indictments that were adequate. Um, and I have a couple of references for you. First, in Georgia, and I've talked about these, so I won't belabor it, but Pasha has been cited to you many times. This is what Pasha said, and it was a RICO conspiracy indictment challenged by a special demur. The indictment clearly gives Pasha notice of the nature of his involvement in the conspiracy, the overt acts attributed to him as advancing the conspiracy, and the underlying predicate offenses which establish racketeering activity. Check, check, check. We have done all three of those. Um, and why say, hey, check, it's because we used Pasha, and we literally did check. Um, Grant versus State. Um, a case that preceded Pasha and is frequently looked to by the Georgia courts to look at the adequacy of indictments. Grant said, the indictments are in no way defective for being insufficient to support a prosecution and conviction. The requisite predicate acts and enterprises comprising the charges against appellants are precisely described and named in each instance. No greater detail was required to allege the RICO offense under Georgia law. And, and Mr. Floyd, I think what I was getting at uh, yeah. is that they'll, you know, say we've reviewed it, we've pronounced it, maybe they'll quote portions, but a lot of times <laughs> they won't do it at length, right? Probably because these indictments are so long. So I just wonder if you've ever pulled any of them and we could actually have that as an attached exhibit by way of direct comparison to see what the Court right. of Appeals was looking at. Um, I, I will tell you, Your Honor, in response to your question, we pulled quite a few federal indictments. Um, and uh, I, I recall reading at least 20. Um, and I would be happy to provide examples if those would be useful to the court. Um, they're under federal law, they're not under Georgia law, but the, the federal sufficiency standard is functionally the same. Um, and uh, uh, or, know, or for example, these Georgia cases that are cited to so frequently like Pasha and some mm -hmm. of those others, I don't know if those are indictments we can get our hands on, just that would be interesting by way of comparison to be actually seeing what the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court was looking at when they said this is sufficient. I'm happy to, I'm happy to try that. Yes. Uh, um, I'm, I hadn't done it before because um, uh, I don't think I've encountered a court that would have appreciated my attaching that in the past. You, I don't mean they to tend be a little homework. weighty. Um, um, but anyhow, just, no, it's an just interesting, a thought. 
It's an interesting point. And, and when I say the federal standard is the same, um, one of the things I noticed and one of my colleagues noticed is we kept going through the formulation of how the Georgia courts state the pleading standards. And I recognized that this sounded very much like federal law, but the Georgia courts generally were not citing the federal cases. There was a time when Georgia appellate courts often did not cite the United States Supreme Court, even if they were using the same language. But if you look at Cochran versus State 157 U.S. 286 at 290, in 1895 case, you'll see the standard is expressed in almost exactly the same the way the Georgia courts put it now. And that continues through a case called Hamling versus United States 418 U.S. 87 at 117, a 1974 case. It really is the same language. And that really is what the federal courts um, are, are following here. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, as I said, I've cited you a number of cases. I'll give you just one more before I sit down. And actually, I mentioned this in Johnson. Um, the court went through it, and this was a challenge to an association, in fact, enterprise that was a street gang called the Block Boys. Uh, and they said, you haven't, you haven't told us enough. Um, that count was 15 pages, ours is 71. Uh, court said it was adequate, it identifies the Block Boys as the criminal enterprise, establishes the time period during which they operated, named the co-conspirators, listed the violations, the constituted predicates, said who performed each act and the data was performed. That's precisely what we've done. Um, and uh, there was an argument in that case that the indictment failed because it didn't tell the defendant exactly what activities conducted were part of the conspiracy's agreement. And the court said, this court has not required that a RICO indictment include such specificity, nor does the Constitution. Um, we refuse to adopt Durden's offbeat position, was the language the Fifth Circuit used to dismiss uh, to dismiss that. So um, the argument that Dr. Eastman started making in his briefs fails. Uh, it doesn't work on Nexus and it doesn't work on Boyle for the reasons I've said. The argument that he makes today is not in his briefs. And recognizing that and uh, any initial reactions just offhand? To this idea well the petition for right right of grievance uh, or the petition uh this is an issue that that has uh, people have alluded alluded to it number one it's not really his grievance he's not the candidate but number two one thing that petitioning does not permit is any sort of lie any sort of false statement um there is no protection for that um, one doesn't get to speak to governmental officials, say something is, that's false, and then say, oh, but that's okay, I was petitioning for, for redress of grievances. Um, the, the conversations with Vice President Pence and his, uh, uh, his closest advisors aren't for redress of grievances, they are asking him to break the law. And in fact, in one of the uh, overt acts we set forth, we actually quote a communication uh, from Dr. Eastman in which he says, uh, and I am paraphrasing, these are not the exact words. He basically says, I'm asking you to violate the law one more time. It makes it abundantly clear. He, he, his position is the law has been violated um, and then he is asking that it be violated again. That is not asking for redress of grievances. That is asking someone to violate the law. Those are not the same things, and there is no protection for that sort of behavior. The last point is, as, as Pasha, Qualey, and other cases that I have cited to you on numerous occasions make clear, um, the only... The only argument that's been set forth here today goes to overt acts alleged against Dr. Eastman. Um, that leaves 142, I believe, alleged against others. Under Pasha, he's responsible 
for all of those. And only one is sufficient to make out a RICO uh, conspiracy violation under the express language of 1614-4C. And so even if he was right, it wouldn't matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Floyd. Mr. Parker, any final thoughts? Just a few. Um, I believe, uh, although I, uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, said he was paraphrasing Dr. Eastman in, in reference to a conversation with uh, the vice president. Um, as I understand the conversation, Dr. Eastman had expressed his opinion that the Electoral Count Act itself was unconstitutional. And that was the reference to violating the law he was referring to, not complying with what he views under, from his perspective, uh, uh, the Electoral Count Act as being an unconstitutional act passed by Congress. Uh, the, um, I think, I think what, what Mr. Floyd on behalf of the state really has crystallized in the argument, and it is going to come down to this, just what are the facts when the state's put forth its evidence? I will acknowledge that what he has said as a matter of law by and large is correct. And I stood here and I say to the court, I will be more than glad to join in with him in providing a joint appendix on indictments. We can, we've worked together over the years, many times we can work together in providing to the court those indictments that Mr. Floyd has identified that answer the courts or provide some insight for the court as to what is sufficient in the details as far as the allegations go. At the end of the day, it's going to be whether or not the state has met its burden in its proof at the trial compared to the allegations in the indictment. And so I agree to that. Uh, and with those words, I have nothing further than to say, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, since we have you here, I believe this was the only... So when they, they, sure thing, Mr. Floyd. The, the specific act, so we don't have to guess about what I was talking about, the specific act is 141, and I don't need to belabor what it says. The court can look at it itself. The language is quoted right there. And okay. For ease of reference, yeah. All right. Well, while we have you here, Mr. Parker, and as well as your client, uh, I believe other than adopted motions, this was the only other substantive one that we needed to address before, you know, a, a case management conference where whenever that day arrives. Is that, do I have that, that right? That's correct. We we did file a what I refer to as a placeholder Fourth Amendment motion dealing with two different, uh, cert, one, a search and seizure of right. Dr. Eastman's cell phone by the FBI. I believe that occurred in New Mexico. Is that correct? Yes, in New Mexico. Right. And, and, and I'm, I'm remembering that one. I wonder, if, since we're all here in the States here, maybe we could provide some clarity on that instead of having Yeah, because any... we haven't seen yet anything in discovery that in, it would appear to come from that uh, source. Uh, if it if the state does have it and they intend to use it, then that that's an issue we we sought to preserve. Sure. Well, let's uh, thank you for for reminding me of that. Let's let's see. Maybe we can even address that today. Uh, just to the state generally, ha do you recall the preliminary kind of placeholder motion to suppress on the cell phone evidence? State have a position on that? Yeah, we we haven't provided it because we don't have. It. And. If the uh, does the state have any leads or intentions or idea of where that could be or when if they would obtain it at this point? At this point, we don't. All right. If that were to change, that would be something you'd have to disclose to the defense, would you not? All right. So, and then the other one dealt with the uh, litigation in federal court in California over the Chapman uh, University files. Um, of Dr. Eastman, there are numerous emails. Some of those did make their way to the January 6th committee, which now have been disclosed, but many, many, many did not. And the reason we raised that as a placeholder is that the federal court in 
the California litigation, one found Dr. Eastman had standing on as to those uh, communications and two required that before any be disclosed to the J6 committee, they be reviewed by a tank team for attorney client communications uh, and whatnot, because that was <clears throat> Even though on some attorney client communications, he found the crime fraud exception. He did. He, the court, the j district judge did not make a across the board ruling on all communications that uh, that the crime fraud exception applied. So Dr. Eastman, licensed attorney, is, is still asserting that issue. Should the state have any material that came forth from that source? OK. All right, and so I'll put that same question to the state, but first, just to, again, as a matter of housekeeping, uh, are, are we all on the same page that as it relates to the phone issue raised by uh, Mr. Parker, that that's effectively moot or not right at this point? Uh, I guess, I, Mr. Parker, I'll put that on you since it was your motion. Based on what you've heard the state say, is there anything to but there's handle? Nothing, uh, what I've heard the state say is they have no, uh, they have no material from the cell phone of Dr. Eastman that was seized by the FBI. Right. And per our standing order, within five days of them obtaining any new evidence that they would intend to introduce a trial, that's supposed to make its way into your hands. All right. So that we should know um, if that ever comes up. All yes, right. I, I, hear, I heard that. Okay. So let's move on then. Uh, he raised the issue of uh, some emails that were seized by the FBI at some point. Is that also something? It sounds like it hasn't made its way into discovery, or has it? We haven't seen any documents uh, that reflect the uh, bait stamp of that Dr. Eastman uniquely placed on the on the Chapman University document or that work. I don't know whether he did it, but someone did it. It's just that that emanates from from his, his employment at Chapman using a computer they owned and control that contain what the federal court found to be clearly attorney-client communications that Dr. Eastman had standing to assert the privilege over. And so in the federal court order, were we to have to litigate this issue, which we would provide to prove that the material had to be reviewed by a taint team before it could be disclosed. And so we're until we know that it's been disclosed and the state has it and the state intends to use it, we have no ability to litigate further. Okay, turning to the state, does this ring a bell? It, it does, Judge. We've actually, we've disclosed everything that we have, um, but we do have a, a search warrant um, that relates to that that's with the filter team now. I, I, well, this is the issue. The search warrant came from a superior court judge of this court. We, 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 we haven't litigated anything because let's set aside the issue of the extraterritorial authority of this court to issue a search warrant for materials in the state of California. You know, this search warrant from this court cannot obviate and supersede a, a United States Superior, a District Court's order as to how that material must be handled. Okay, so I'm I'm still trying to get up to, to speed on this and see where we are. Y'all are ahead of me because I don't know what's in discovery. Uh, so it sounds like the evidence that you're saying the state may introduce, they have actually got with a filter team right now, pursuant to a search warrant obtained by an, uh, a judge in Fulton County. Well, I, I don't think I signed that. Uh, uh, you'd have to remind me. Um, and you're still waiting on the results of that. Do you have a time frame for that? Um, the last conversation that we had with the filter team judge, he had not got they had not gotten to it yet. Um, but we had some indication that they would make their way through uh, the any any documents that they would have um, within a three week period. We can follow up. On All right. So there's a possibility the filter team gets through it. They disclose to you that there's nothing matching the criteria, and so there's really nothing that needs to be suppressed because you don't have anything, right? Um, but in three weeks, maybe they do give you something that's exactly along the lines of what Mr. Parker is identifying a, as, in his contention, having some legal issues that we need to sort through. Okay. 
All right. So then it sounds like we'll have a better idea of that later next month and whether we need to come back on an evidentiary hearing on that. And 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 once once you've we've identified that, Mr. Parker, if you could just, you know, particularize your motion and supplement it and we'll get it scheduled. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Okay. Good to know. Um and if after a month you haven't heard anything from the state or the filter team, uh, ask, let's ask for an update from the state and, and try to hold them to that deadline. Be glad to do that, Your Honor. Okay. Was there anything else? Nothing further on behalf of Dr. Reisman. Okay. All right. Well, is there anything else from the state then? Nothing further. All right. And I think there had been some other attorneys just generally jumping on the Zoom. They weren't noticed to be arguing on anything, but... I kind of open the floor to any other business since we have this state here. Not hearing anything. Uh, we'll transition over to Mr. Floyd. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, let's transition over. Uh, same case number, but this is State versus Harrison Floyd. And we are back together from the last time we had had a hearing on this, I believe was in November, if I'm not mistaken. And this is on the uh, motions to uh, quash, as well as uh, tangentially the motion to unseal, I believe, the um, election materials filed back in September. And let me just kind of try to lay out the where we are and I'll let the parties jump in to supplement as they see it. But I believe where we had left it is we had heard some initial argument from uh, on behalf of the clerk of Superior Court and on behalf of uh, Fulton County Board of Elections uh, that not only in their contention were these materials not relevant, but um, that that would be unduly oppressive or burdensome to produce them. And so I took under the advisement the relevance issue, and I think that uh, I don't know if that's necessarily something we need to get into further today, but the overriding focus was that exactly what it would take to produce these materials. And uh, after that uh, hearing back in November, we had uh, Mr. Floyd's team uh, come back with an amended subpoena request. Was that ever made a part of the record? Uh, well, actually, first, let me do this. We need to identify counsel for the record and uh, waive your client's presence. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Christopher Kachurov for Mr. Floyd and my co-counsel. Todd Harding, Your Honor. Aaron McCullough, Your Honor. And uh, Mr. Floyd uh, has given you his express permission to proceed without him? Yes, sir, he has. All right. And on behalf of the county? Good afternoon, Judge. Chad Alexis on behalf of the clerk. Okay, and Mr. Alexis, just for the benefit of our court reporter, if you could really make sure to speak up and, and into a microphone. Um, medically, are you able to proceed today? Please, Judge. Okay, all right, and uh, who else do we have? David Loman, Your Honor. Can you spell that for the court reporter? Last name Loman, L-O-W-M-A-N. First name, David. All right, thank you. Okay, and so uh, back to... Uh, 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 Floyd's team here. Did we ever make the amended subpoena part of the record or has it been up to this point? Just want to make sure everything's complete. 
not quite sure, Judge. I apologize. We'll we'll make it so if, if it hasn't been. And but then to continue kind of the prologue here is that uh, we received a response back from Fulton County, kind of point by point, saying how many man hours it would take to comply, and it was substantial. And uh, in the thousands, if not, I think tens of thousands of hours. 57,000 hours on some of these issues. And so I think where we left it is very much that we have contested issues of fact. I don't know if these are going to be solved by way of proffer. And so um, I, I think um, at this point, uh, well, let me start there. Anything we need to add before we get into it in terms of the lay of the land? Let me, I mean, let me start with, I'll start with Mr. Kutcher, just because you're standing up here. Um, I would propose that we go through them. Some we can go through pretty quickly. Some I can agree with. I'm not going to nitpick over an hour here or two hours there. And I think I can add some clarity to why there's no need to put 37 years of manpower into a, what should have been done in one day on November 3rd, 2020. Okay. Uh, so at this point, you think we can still just kind of go through this? And almost a mediation style. We don't need to have a witness here telling you exactly how something's produced and in, in the manner. I agree because a lot of this stuff, believe it or not, I, I mean, I have served as the basis for our response to the motion to quash, which were open records requests. But some open records requests have certifications, others don't. And I think that I can add clarity to each of the requests and their corresponding time estimates and why their time estimates are incorrect. And I think it'll make sense to the court. Okay. Well, I'll do it. Uh, I mean, I'm optimistic that that's the case. I will say the caveat is, I, I don't know the nuances of how ballots are collected and counted, and 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 I think you have done your your studying on these things. So, for me to grasp exactly how these are collected and the processes behind them, we may need to lay out more, so we can really understand that. But we'll see how we go, uh, Mr. Alexis. Yeah, I just want to put on the record that we are not a party to this case. You know, we're just here to address the subpoena. You know, we don't have a dog in the fight. Aside from the relevance issue, our only contention is that this is burdensome and oppressive. We're in the middle of a federal election. To that end, <clears throat> Judge, we do have two witnesses here who the court can make inquiries to, but I do agree that a mediation style approach may be best because again, as non-parties, you know, I'd hate to subject my clients to being grilled and cross-examined. And, and who are those two witnesses you'd have? We have Mariska Bodison and Derek Gilstrap. And you are ordinarily we would have our directors and leadership come in and testify. But again, we are preparing for a federal election. Um, sure. I can have them stand and introduce themselves. Uh, I, I think for now, if you could just let me know uh, what their respective titles are and, and what they would be testifying to generally. Adler. I get shaky on their title. So let me just uh, or just generally here. what their job roles are, why they're here, why they have the expertise. Mr. Gilstrap is in uh, IT. He does the tech part of of um elections department and Ms. Bodison, she does she's the executive um assistant to the BRE and for the elections department. Okay. All right, so turning to the uh amended subpoena with the additions provided by Fulton County with the time estimates. And page three, we have items to be produced. Uh, Mr. Kuturev, I think you offered to kind of just take the lead on this. You know, I'll just let you have the floor. So for the first item, user manuals, four hours. No disagreement. The issue there is, uh, my, I talked to my colleague ahead of time before the hearing, trying to work some of the things out. Probably should have talked more with him. But he said those are in a warehouse in a box, and so they have to spend time to go get them. I suggested, well, uh, maybe Dominion can provide those user manuals that were in use at the time via PDF. Um, the option was, well, you can subpoena Dominion. Well, I didn't want to do that because if I subpoenaed Dominion, then the response might be, well, those weren't the ones that we had. So I was hoping that we could short circuit some of this. So, I mean, some of it, it, it is what it is. I'm not going to argue about number one. Number two, an election equipment inventory. They should have a list of these things. I don't understand why it would take 24 hours to to pull up lists with, with all of the 
different machines and what the serial numbers are on the machines, you would think that there is an inventory somewhere in a file. It, and it's, we're looking for digital production. I'm not looking for new copies of what was in existence in 2020. Uh, what if, uh, this is where we wanted to pause, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the open record standard, which is they're not obligated to go out and create documents for you. If, if they're going to sit here and testify today is that they don't keep that list and that they would have yeah, to go and around and actually make you a list. What happens then? If that's what the answer is, the response, they don't go around keeping the list, then they don't go around keeping the list. I accept the response, you know, but I just want to know what they have and what they don't have. All right. Well, let's start there. Uh, item two on the items to be produced. Your Honor, if it might be easier for my colleague and myself, you want me you to can just remain that? seated. That's fine. Just make sure you get that microphone very close to your mouth. Okay. <laughs> Is this the one that you said was the overnight stuff? Okay, uh, Judge, a lot of these, <clears throat> a lot of this information is in hard copy. <clears throat> well, pursuant to election code, it was submitted to the clerk, and it is in that warehouse that we that um opposing counsel just mentioned. So to actually go and get this information would require employees to go to the warehouse and rummage through the boxes and pallets to try to find the information that's needed. And from what I understand, we're looking at about 100 pallets with maybe 30 to 45 boxes per pallet. And because they've been moved so many times, there's no, there's no way to determine what sort of, I guess, format they're in. They're not arranged in a particular order. So first to actually go find it, it wouldn't take five minutes, Judge. And that's why we put the 24 hour time period on it. And, and it sounds like that's a similar process to what you were gonna need to do for user manuals. So why the difference between the four hours and the 24 hours? <clears throat> well, I think it's because it's, we're looking for more information in number two as opposed to one. Okay, and uh, Mr. Kucherov, uh, feel free to re respond to that. But I'm also wondering too, I guess, as we go along through here, accepting for today, Mr. Floyd's relevance solely for discovery purposes. We're not saying that this could potentially be relevant at trial. That's another bridge to cross when we get there. Why is this particular aspect of your request relevant to essentially auditing uh, the election? Because part of the audit process requires taking the inventory of the system that created, for instance, the poll tabulator tape. It's, it shows you security. Is the election secure? Were the machines that were said to be used actually used? And it's a way to match up serial numbers from machines and devices to other types of reports. All right. So once you've got serial numbers for all these devices, you're saying you can then compare that to something else? A number of things. For instance, uh, the logic and accuracy testing to see which equipment was tested and which equipment was not. <clears throat> okay. And more to uh, in response to what he added. I'm not going to argue about the 24 hours. If they think that's their time estimate and it's in the warehouse, I get it. So one and two. All right. And we'll move on to number three. We've got... 688 hours listed for, um, I guess this is still part of item two, rather. 688 hours for election equipment uh, with test results. Uh, and this is all the tabulators. and Actually, Your Honor, it's, it's the logic and accuracy testing. It's, we're literally looking for uh, the re test results for all the things that have serial numbers. So I would think that they could all be produced together. I, mean, I don't know how they keep it in the boxes, whether they haphazardly throw them in the boxes with ballots. I would think it'd be some just a couple ballots or a couple boxes that have administrative items in them that they could pull from. Okay, so what can you tell us about the logic and accuracy testing results? So the bulk of this of these hours come from the poll tapes, and we're looking at about 656 open tapes and 656 closed tapes. 
and each tape is about 12 feet long. <coughs> of course, if we're handing over <coughs> information that, or I guess documents that they would produce an evidence, we'd, ha we'd give them a copy. So first I actually copy the tapes, we'd have to put them on the printer piece. Well, we've already, y'all have already surpassed what I'd warned you about, which is when you say tape, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm thinking okay. videotape, I, I don't know. Oh, it's a, you wanna explain what the poll tape is? It's, it's uh, a tape produced by the scanner. A scanner tape that's produced when uh, we do this our Mr. Loman. LNA testing. Oh, actually, this person hasn't identified themselves for the oh, record. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, my name is Jerry Gilstrap. I'm okay. election system supervisor. All right, great. And you were explaining to us uh, what it means to have a poll tape. What produces it and what's it look like and all of that. The poll tape is produced uh, from our scanners, our tabulators. They produce the poll tape once we uh, run the ballots from our LNA testing through the scanner. Uh, it produces a uh, a tape of uh, all the results from from those ballots. So it's not more like a it's not like a digital file. I'm picturing a movie reel. Is it something like that? Like a old, I mean, a, like a, a wound tape on a wheel. Uh, again, it's, it's, like, it's like a calculator roll of tape. It's like a uh, a like like you have a cash register and the tape produces once you uh, okay once you uh, buy something so that that like does that. sound like something it's not they're just picking up and copying it on a hard drive this is something physical that they have to then make into another format and that takes time that's true but 688 i don't think it's 688 hours and the reason why i say that is is because a fulton records an open records request dated december the 1st 2021 provided tabulator poll tapes for the 11-3-2020 election, including those that were used for advanced voting and logic and accuracy testing. So they actually should have these scans already uh, done, first of all. And I think that that would be, and I've got the open records request number. Sure. Let's start there. Has this already been produced in some format to somebody? I can't speak to that, Judge. I, I really can't. If it if it has, I can I can go look at it, but I can tell you what the process is. And, the, and <clears throat> the, we got this number based on what they have done in the past when they have to give the information to, let's say, the SOS. And basically you put it on the, on the printer and you print each portion of it. And because it's 12 feet long, you have to close the copier, open it, move it to the side, close the copier, open it, move it to the side. And that takes about 30 minutes per tape. So if you have 656 tapes and you're printing and you're doing a, 30 minutes per tape, Judge, and you're doing that for open and closed tapes, you're looking at 656 hours. And, and let me add to this. We're, we're actually looking, if you read the, one of the things we're looking for is the actual LNA report itself. It has the testing results on it. And that should not require more than a couple of hours to copy that. I, mean, I don't understand how we get 688 hours I know I don't even know what the poll tapes are, and they're twelve feet long. But it doesn't take thirty minutes to copy uh, a twelve foot long receipt, essentially. Um, so I don't think six hundred eighty hours is appropriate. Um, and I will remind the court: Mr. Floyd is looking at thirty seven years, and they're claiming it's going to take more time than the, the amount of jail sentence that he's faced with at this point. So I don't. What, all what, this was, what, should have been done on November third. What are the total? number of roles that are um at issue here and to satisfy this how many no. how many pull tape roles are there total 656 open and 656 close and how does one get open and how does one get closed no well they one's called an open tape and one's called a closed tape so they do the open tape at the beginning of the election and do the, they do the closed tape at the end of the election and <laughs> and <clears throat> the subpoena asks for both yes you said it was 656 open, and how many are closed? And 656. Okay. Well. And each of these are 12 feet long? Yeah, about 12 feet long, yeah. So there's only over 12,000 of, or excuse me, not 12,000, 1,200 of these that they'd have to be copying. I can buy the scanner for the county. The scanner will cost me about $400, and I'll have each one be scanned in about a minute. The county will appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> if, if that's going to be the uh, solution, sold. Well, 
uh, so there's a special scanner that you don't have to then do each foot by foot by foot? Not that I'm aware of, Judge. I, I don't But you have one? Yes, Your Honor. We can supply one. Okay. Well, again, I think these are things that you, the two of y'all know more about this than I do. I don't know what I'm, value I'm adding to this, but we can keep going in this manner. It sounds like, again, something that could have been solved through an email. Right. <laughs> um, I'll make this easier for my colleague. I know he yeah. wants, we talked about this earlier. Uh, four, five, six. Or I should say request four through 11. And there's no argument on. Does that include just because since we're, have, I see the labeling, there's a three on, on the top of page four. Uh, no, that's what we, that was the LNA testing. We were, that was part of the LNA testing. We, what I'll do is I will provide a scanner for the county, but I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm accounting this right. So the top of page four, there's, a, there's labeled paragraph three underneath election certification packet. Yes, uh, yes. I'm looking at the amended subpoena. Are we on the same page? I think so. I, I have under, yeah. So the election certification packet section. Okay, yeah. The election night reporting web page, the chain of custody, no disagreement. Okay. <clears throat> The ballot images, which is the next section, I do quibble with that because they already have it in a zip file. They sent all this stuff. I'm sure they've sent this stuff to the SOS, Secretary of State. So I don't understand why 24 hours, when they, they don't need 24 hours to look, unless they have to go look for it. Uh, but I would think that that's on a computer hard drive or something that they can just zip to another. Okay. So images, they have to be, they have to be copied. So moving on, we're now at, on the bottom of page four of the amended subpoena with responses, ballot images, where I think the county had replied back to 24 hours. Any insight on that? Yeah. That's, that's a, okay. So, Judge, in review of this request, uh, we did state it as 24 hours, but it should have been more an overnight um run and that's because we actually have to i guess fire the system up and let it run overnight so it's supposed to be a one-day turnaround but it ended up getting logged in as 24 hours okay so i think what we actually need to reflect is the man hours because that's what they're gonna have to cut you a check for right so what are the man hours to get the ballot images to you And Judge, we can't run both systems at the same time, the the original count and the recount. So it'll have to be done separately. And that's, I mean, we, we do it overnight one day and then overnight the next day. Yeah, and I don't think the time is so much our focus is, so, is what, the, what the man hours are and how much, you know, they owe you. Okay. Can I confirm? Oh, Judge, it'll, the actual work itself, uh, two hours, and then it'll just it'll just be a matter of the system populating the information overnight. All right. So ballot images revised estimate of two hours. Any uh, issues with that, Mr. Chair? Okay. I uh, seeing none for the record. Moving on. Tabulator files and reports. The heading. This is listing uh, two thousand eight hundred sixty-six hours. Uh, I, I think mainly because it's saying it doesn't exist in the format requested. I'm saying uh, any initial reactions to that. So would that be one hour? Judge, we uh, made a few modifications on this as well. Okay. <coughs> so for 14, 14A, we don't have the information requested in that format. 
uh, 14b, it will be much like the last one we just discussed, wherein the system will have to be fired up and run overnight. So that's why we have the, uh, the eight hours now. The man hours itself would probably be an hour. As for 14c, we're looking at, because we have the open poll tapes, the status tapes, and the closed tapes, we're looking at 1968 tapes. Are these the same opening quotes from the first one? No, that's LNA tapes. Oh, the tapes. Okay. So we're looking at 1,968 tapes, and at 30 minutes per tape, that's 984 hours. This is the same issue as before that the bulk of this time is because of uh, scanner limitations? Yes. All right. And so potentially that is going to be dramatically lessened if you have better equipment. I mean, if this this equipment exists, yeah, I I will agree with that. I mean, and one thing I just want to, I guess, keep in the court's air is that we do still have to go in the warehouse and locate this stuff. So. Right. Well, I think I mean that's just that's reflected okay. in in the hours. I I, I don't I'm not, I don't think we can quibble with that. But okay. And as for number fifteen, we will have to contact knowing to get that information and once we do that we're on knowing's time um <clears throat> for the say, say that again the what time knowing that's the vendor i'm sorry judge so is this something that's not even in your possession it's not then i don't see how you could respond to that subpoena all uh right -huh. we couldn't probably get the material without permission from the county to obtain it from where you said knowing knowing yes well i think a vendor would have to respond to a court order for a subpoena Right, so I'll, I'm going to go ahead and send a subpoena out for that's the that's the tabulator poll closing tapes, number fifteen. My numbering is off. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, copies of all tabulated poll closing reports and tabulated reports generated by each precinct and polling location. Yes. Okay. Got it. You need to make sure you talk into the microphone. Our court reporters uh -huh. having some trouble. And and just for the, I'll just state this for the record: any conversations between counsel. We're not going to have those on the record, okay? So, uh, you were going down the list here. I think you still had. It sounds like bottom line for the entire section listed tabulator files and reports, where originally the estimate was two thousand eight hundred sixty-six hours. That's largely driven by copying limitations that may be remedied through upgraded equipment. Is that fair? Uh, yes, Judge. Okay. So we'll flag that. I think where we're getting with this is, assuming we can make it through all this, is that uh, the parties are going to need to, again, uh, direct them to confer once more, and I'll need an updated and revised uh, time estimate within a week or two. We'll talk more about how much time that's going to take. Um, all right. Election management system, EMS. County's estimate was 72 hours. Is there concern with that from Mr. Floyd? No, Your Honor. All right. Backup copies of hard drives, SD drives, and USB drives. County uh, estimated 16 hours. Any concerns there? Which number? Judge, my numbering is off. I'm sorry. And so I tried to start just looking at headings now instead yeah. of the numbers. Backup copies of hard drives? Right. I don't think the county... Maybe county can elucidate on this. Uh, it said it didn't have the original. The original format was not an in case format, and maybe there since our tech guys here, when we say in case format. We're basically talking about a forensic image, which is a standard in the industry, and that copies everything on a hard drive, including the empty spaces, without impacting the integrity of the drive. To mirror, you yes, your honor, we cannot produce those. We cannot produce. We we're not able to produce those in that format. In that format, and why not? Basically, um, our our system uh, would not allow us to produce those. I mean, um, they may be able to uh, uh, get that from Dominion. On the Secretary of State, uh, they may be able to produce those, but we cannot produce those. All right, but in the format that you could produce them in, was that part of the estimate? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. 
Okay. All right. With that proffer. I, uh, sorry, I didn't hear the last part, Your Honor. He was saying that they can produce them, but it has to be in a different format, and that's what accounts for the 16 hours. I mean, if that's what they have, it's the original 16 hours in, in the format without making an image of the actual drive, I'll take it. All right, moving on, reports and logs, they list four hours for that. No objection. And then we have lists of several items. No objection. Okay, and that's, they say number 25 through 41, for 24 hours to produce that. We have oath documents, which they, which they say will take six to eight hours to produce. I, I don't want, like I said, I don't try not to be picky, but six to eight hours for documents that basically show somebody took an oath. I don't under, maybe I'm, I misunderstand, but it seems that that's a pretty quick one in the folder. Are those all kept in, in the same place or are those scattered about? Warehouse, Judge. So it's in the warehouse. Do you, are these boxes labeled or are they just? I can't speak to what, what the uh, format of the boxes are right now, but from what I understand, they're not in, in a properly identifiable order. <laughs> Well, that leads me to have less confidence in these estimates of the, if we have no idea where they are in the warehouse or the status of them or the state they're in, how did we ever arrive at six to eight hours to begin with? Well, Judge, we were trying to give conservative estimates because we, we do want to work with whomever, you know, again, we don't have a dog in the fight. Um, you know, we just believe that if we, I guess, did a diligent search that we can come up with this information within that time period. Okay. I, I do say, hey, it's it's a, about a 90 to 100 pallets, but again, it's still only 90 to 100 pallets, so six, eight hours may work. And again, I'm trying to draw on kind of open records experience where often in response, you give an estimate. Uh -huh. And if it's actually less time is spent, the ultimate bill is less, right? Um, or you get halfway through and you start warning the other side, hey, it's actually going to be higher than we thought. Do you want us to keep going? I right. think that's what we're going to have to do on this as well. And we can do this in stages. And um, But I also think part of this is going to have to be paid up front. We can get into all these things. I think these are some things that the parties can negotiate and get back to me on. But I just want to flag these issues for you all. Uh, it sounds like that's something that on the... Um, the oath documents let's take another closer look at that in terms of what we think the state of the warehouse is and actually how long it takes to drive over there and find that box if they're all in the same box okay okay uh signatures absentee ballots yeah. envelopes envelopes yes your honor so we're looking for the outer part of the envelope the estimate was fifty-seven thousand hours and i think maybe uh, well, we, we started i think let's well let's, i know that's the heart of it but let's start with i think paragraph 43 says The outer, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. Under the heading, I've got 72 hours unredacted, 150 hours redacted. What is, is that in reference to something different than the 5,700 hours, 57,000 hours? Yeah, so the, um, <clears throat> the, the signature exemplars, that's the 57,000 hours in the absentee ballot envelopes. That's the 72 hours. Okay, let's start with the envelopes. Uh, and remind me, what would be redacted if they are redacted? What would be unredacted? Okay. Do you want to explain the envelopes? And uh, if you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, sir. Mariska Bodison. The executive assistant and the board director. The board okay. secretary, excuse me. And so uh, what needs to be redacted off these that effectively doubles the time to produce them? On the old envelope, there is uh, the date of birth. Okay. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry, Your Honor. The date of birth. Oh, date of birth. And Judge, if I can just um, give an explanation as to the redaction process. So <clears throat> usually when we would make a copy of something, we take a, a magic marker, we would strike through. But usually if you hold that paper to the light, you can still see some of the information. So what happens is that we have to then make another copy and possibly redact again. And that's what causes the extra time. Because your plan is to produce these in physical form? You're not just going to send them in a PDF? Well, well the, env the envelopes themselves, 
<coughs> they are in a physical format and you actually have to do them one by one because they're they're used envelopes. So if you try to scan them in in batches, they will just jam in the printer. Okay. What do you think, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yes, Ketcher? so I, this is where I, I think I can short circuit this tremendously. I think they'll be. My understanding from talking with my, my colleague earlier is that the Blue Crest sorting and signature verification machine was not operational. So I didn't really want new scanned images. I wanted the existing scanned images that were done on November 3rd for purposes of signature verification. So my understanding is that did not occur because the Blue Crest mach verification machine is not working for the 2020 general. Yeah, yeah I'm, right. I'm not commenting on that. Yeah. All right, we've got someone. It's not that much longer. Do we know who that is? Okay, Mr. Alexis. I'm not commenting on, on whether or not the Blue Crest machines were, were working. We, we didn't use the Blue Crest machines um, at that time period. Okay, so if the subpoena as intended by Mr. Floyd is for the image, any images produced by this machine on this date, your response is you don't have any in your possession. That's correct, Judge. So, so they're... Can you go ahead? Can you oh, see? Give me a second, Your Honor. Sure. Off mute. No, I have to. Thank you. Your Honor, I can have my tech guy up here on site under their, under their tech supervision. He can write a script that can, once we scan all the files, we can uh, have a script that automatically blocks out the date of birth. That is the, that is PII under Georgia law. Well, we still have to- Well, we're, we're jumping back in time to the envelopes. Right. So on the, on the envelopes, you're saying that you think you have a more efficient way to redact them. Correct. I have a more efficient way, but I just, my colleague is saying that they didn't do signature verification using the uh, Blue Crest sorting and signature verification machine? Correct. Okay. And so, so is that solely the 57,000 hours estimate? I'm sorry, are we on to the next one? Oh, we hadn't gotten there. Okay, we're still just on the 150 hours. Yeah. Okay. And is that where the Blue Crest becomes relevant? I, I'm looking at Mr. Floyd's team. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, um, the Blue Crest sorting and signature verification machine would take the ballot envelope and scan it and create an image of it image appears on screen with a signature exemplar and the two are compared that way. Okay. So my understanding is now the blue crest sorting and signature verification machine was not working or no, we just, we didn't use it. They did. They did. They did not use that. Did not use it. We so for the it. item you're requesting to obtain for the scans of all the outer envelopes, they're going to have to, they would have to rescan those again is what we're hearing. Well, it sounds like they weren't, they were never scanned to begin with. And so, I don't know. Unless so if they do, were scanned, I want the scanned version. Right. That they had on that day. So are there any are there any documents in the county's possession of these items having already been scanned? Not that I'm aware of, but I can check at headquarters and see if they do have it. Okay. So the difference here is not so much that there's a total new rescanning. It's what was scanned and is still in your possession from that day. Well, uh, are we are we are we making the distinction here? Nothing was scanned, Your Honor. Okay, so we're absolutely clear. We're talking about the outer return envelopes in November, twenty twenty. Okay, so where does that leave your subpoena request? I think, Your Honor, if we can put that to the side, like that's as an as an item for me to work out with the county, so I understand exactly because I was under the impression that. They had a sorting machine that did all that. So if that signature verification process was not used, I just want to be able to see what, so I can, when we do our audit, we can look at it and say, okay, this is what was done. Um, and, and I'll see whether I actually need those or not. I don't, I'm not sure at this point. All right. Um, takes us on, is that, does this now take us to the signature exemplars and reference images or is that the same thing? Uh, this takes us to that new section, Judge. 
The sig yeah, the signature exemplar is under the same section. Same uh, issue. Same image, yeah, yeah. But no, it's a different image. It's a separate image from the ballot envelope image. One is signed on the back. Okay. And they use that. So, so this whole section, you're setting that aside for now? Yeah, for, yes, I'm setting that aside. Okay, then that takes us to absentee ballot application forms. Which... Actually, no, I'm sorry. You're, I, I apologize. We do want 45. Our 40, number 44, the provide all signature exemplars and reference images for all registered voters. Okay, so that is the 57,000 hour response. And actually, Judge, it's just the signature exemplars. Those are digital. That should be another copying of, of, of a digital file, a massive file. So, Judge, we do not have a file of simply signatures. <clears throat> we actually have them in different databases for different voters. And we're looking at 860,000 voters. And we have two different systems that we have to look in to ensure that we do find a signature, because if it's not in one, it could be in the other. So at 860,000, and let's conservatively say we can check each system in two minutes, we're looking at four minutes per. So 860,000 multiplied by four minutes gives us three, million plus minutes you divide that by 60. okay a lot of time so what is it that you're doing in those four minutes exactly per voter we're going to check one system to see if we can find a signature and if it's not there we'll check the other system and why do we need to check either system why not just have both if we think they're in there somewhere i'm not following so as, as, as i'm understanding it there's just a general database that has yeah. all these signatures in it well, yeah. well no, why do we need to cross-reference them no it's, it's not it's not a database of signatures we actually have to go into the the database and find the the voter and look up look at the information and search through and find the signature wherever it may fall and then when we get that we i guess export it somewhere have it printed and if it's not in that database we go f look in the other database to find it <clears throat> So essentially you have a database with each voter as its own folder or, or file in some way. And to go in and it pull out the signature image, that's what's taking the time? Yes, sir. So for each voter, I would have to put in your driver's license number or your voter registration number. I then have to go to your profile to see if you actually have a signature on file. If in the Georgia, uh, if in the registration database, Georgia's registration database, you don't have a signature on file, we have an in-house electronic uh, database that we uh, scan documents into and we check that. There are no guarantees that we'll have all 860,000 signatures. The hope is that we will. We're not looking for 860,000. We're only looking for the absentee ballot signatures at this point. Um, we said all registered voters yeah. in your request. I'm sorry. I'm still stuck on number four. On, on which one? Let me, let me well, I thought we'd one. moved on to 44. You'd said 43 was you needed to double check about the um, the machines and the signature verification audit. We were looking at 44. That's the 57,000 hour request. Right. Okay. So... so so 44 and 45, if I can put that to the side to talk, I think I can work that out with them. So I understand the process. I don't want to de delay this anymore. I think we can get through that. Okay. And I can talk, work with a county's IT person and, and my colleague and get a solution for both of those together. Okay. Then maybe I just need a certification from the county that we didn't use the, we didn't do signature verification. Well, I don't know if you're ever going to get a certification because... I don't know if that's allowed through the subpoena process. I mean, you could always call them as a witness. Or sure. If they want to voluntarily give you a certification, great. But uh, again, what is what is being asked of this court is whether to enforce the subpoena, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. And that is whether documents are in their possession or whether they're not. Uh, and I think that's taking us closer to the end. The last thing we have is hardware and networking uh, with 32 hours of, of work. We skipped one, I believe, Judge, the absentee ballot application. Oh, well, I thought you said 45. I think that's about our numbering being off again. Yeah. I'm okay, sorry, so Judge. absentee ballot application form, 10,000 hours redacted. Yeah. I, again, I, my, my, I can have my tech guy show up and write a script that automatically redacts it, and you can hold it up to the light all day long, and you won't see the date of birth. The only thing on the – and I have a 2020 application here. 
the only thing on it that is PII is a uh, one line that says date of birth. So, okay, yeah. if I could get the county to walk me through um, their thought process here. So, on the application from 2020, there is uh, the date of birth, their email address, their phone number. Um, yeah, so there's actually multiple areas that you, you're required to redact. Your Honor, under Georgia law, the only PII is the date of birth. Nothing else is PII. Yeah. Now, we don't intend to go publish this. We're not going to publish this. This is for our... I mean, there's going to be, there'd be a protective order no matter what we do Correct. with this. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then we can go into the details of what that would look like. I think we've already expected here that the parties need to continue their conversations here's what i would ask to add to the agenda is that you'd be outlining exactly to the county the process and how you're planning to review this who would be involved and then i'll let the county make the initial decision of whether they think that's um, adequately protecting uh, the date of birth if, if that's something we need to come back and, and clarify um, and and that's something you could also make preconditions of and ask um or suggest what else could be done again i'm trying to encourage the parties to find the middle ground here um but the bottom line if it's if it's assuming it's unredacted and the county decides to take you up on this offer of software i'm not saying they have to because they might not be comfortable with whatever this program is you're proposing um this this unredacted the 460 hours where does that come from so judge we have and I, I think that number could be, uh, we have 400 and what was it? 470,000, 470,000 absentee ballot applications. Um, you do them in batches of 150 at 15 minutes per, you know, the I will start racking up at that point. Yeah. Okay. So th basically you're saying you have to pull these one by one or these aren't something that can just be pulled in mass no we, we can pull them in mass but when you have to feed them into the printer you know you can only feed them in at in so many uh so but many when batches. you say you're pulling them in mass can't you just save them as a digital file do we have to print them all i oh, know they're, they're in physical format they're they're in physical format they are currently in physical format yes judge well so i understand that some would have been done online that you could do your online registration as well no so if you don't have to write this. If device. they will, one second, Your Honor. Uh, Judge, if they came in in emails, we'll have to be combing through emails to find the applications. But all the applications were printed. <clears throat> okay. I'm still getting the impression just generally here that the we haven't placed our finger exactly on what it is that's being asked and how it could be produced and whether it's the most cost effective way and whether there are alternatives. And so I, 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 the ultimate point, I know we still have one more section to cover, but to the uh, just like the previous two sections, it, it it seems like we're still not ready to make a ruling if I need to make a ruling and what I would uh, what I would just go ahead and say at this point is um, I would propose again directing the parties to address the issues we've covered today and some of the points we have brought up uh, that by February 2nd I'd like that's two weeks from now that we have a little more guidance that you can provide me perhaps with an amended amended subpoena and uh, maybe more narrowly tailor the time estimates. And again, I think more of an exchange of information is going to reduce a lot of time on the back end um, of what needs to happen. And I think what you're also going to need to do as well is start putting those hours into a, a cost, you know, exactly what is it going to cost per hour as well, right? Okay. And if there's equipment, uh, again, uh, I would I would encourage everyone to find ways that if there's a, a more efficient way of doing it, digital or otherwise, that we that we do that, and it's not just the longest way possible. So if there is a a type of a piece of equipment that can make it more um, 
make it more efficient more quickly, how much is it going to cost to buy that piece of equipment? If he can identify you a scanner and it's $10,000, maybe you buy that scanner instead of saying it's going to be 20,000 hours, right? Well, I mean... <laughs> And no, I'm not saying you buy it because he's okay. going to pay for it. <laughs> okay, I want it back. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll yeah. see. Um, I, that, I just, I'm, that's what I'm clarifying is that okay. when you're making the bill, <laughs> we can do this in a way that. And, and Judge, you know the the yeah. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that a lot of the stuff from 2020, it, it's just all in physical format. You know, things were done a lot differently back then. You know, back then, like two years. Hey. It's not that long ago, right? Listen, COVID has changed the uh, okay. Has changed the whole time perspective, you know. And you know, we're, a lot of things have changed um, in Fulton County elections and how we, uh, I guess, process information and store information. So, you know, we're just sort of um, we're just sort of stuck in that in that regard. Okay, uh, understood. And so I think that's why you're, we're having to work through so much, and I appreciate y'all continuing to do that. Uh, but I think that where we stand now and the, the demands of this case, uh, that we, we're going to need to still work through those. Fair enough. Okay. So I'll wait to hear back from you another report uh, on 112. In a perfect world, maybe y'all have come to terms and something along the lines of what was presented from the Secretary of State's office and the GBI with the protective order agreed to by the parties with the amended subpoena made part of the record with the terms and conditions with how what payment is to be conferred, conveyed and when. Again, with some of these ideas in mind, how much up front? Is there going to be steps along the way where you pause and give them updated estimates? All those kind of things. I think these are the things, things you need to think through. Okay. And what else do you think we need to discuss today? Yeah, and that's going to be... You know, just saying up front, that will be difficult as we are prepping for a federal election. We have all the time in the world. We're not rushing anything. So I want to get it right. Sure. So if after two weeks you're still stuck, you think you need more time, let me know. And then let me know how much more time you need. Yes, Judge. Okay. What else? Nothing from us. Okay. It's been great, Your Honor. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to them before. And, and, and I didn't realize they were tech guys were here. I would have had at it. Um, okay. Fair enough. Um, I'm trying to, I'll, I'll try to avoid what happened today where we just got really behind schedule, but I am trying to prioritize getting some of the other hearings. Because if so, I may say, generally speaking, um, if we can have schedules where we have, you know, our brief, you got your motion filed, you've got your memorandum of law, like I want to do on one, the state gets its opportunity and then we get a reply and that's set for issue. We, we do the hearing. I think that's much more uh, efficient and less policy on, on my resources and even the court's resources because going back and having additional hearings and back and forth is no i think that's a fair point I, I just i never know unlike you know federal practice where it's just assumed someone's going to file a response and reply right that's not generally what we do it's it's just if you want to right and so i haven't really stepped in and said required it yet because everyone's seems to elect to do it so if that's going to continue to be the practice then i think all we need to make clear is um what what the expectations are from the parties but i mean generally when you file the motion that's considered step one and and i know you still want to file a, resp a reply right and so we can allow that um so I, I guess what i'm hearing from you is you think that the 26th is is too tight a turnaround for that yes your honor and i and i think there's other i mean the, the state is not here so i don't right I don't, no we're just talking logistics mm -hmm. If logistically speaking, there's other matters in the docket that I think need to be heard first. Um, the, the February 15th matter is going to be heard. And I didn't think much of it until uh, just a couple of days ago, but that would be something that I would want to have heard first before my motions are scheduled. Well, I don't know if I can promise that uh, just because I'd, I'd kind of set aside the week of February 12th to just try to have as many hearings and motions as we can. And since the latter half of that week is devoted to that motion, I still want to utilize the 12th, 13th, and 14th, just as a heads up. But we can continue this discussion with all the parties attached to the email. Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge. All right. We'll be off the record. Thank you, everybody. Who's who's not released? Oh, well, we're off the record. We are adjourned. I'm released. Here. Okay.
thanks so much for watching. We're only a few subscribers short of 2 million subs. Please subscribe right now to the Midas Touch YouTube channel for free and help us grow this unapologetically pro-democracy network.